Hello everyone. It has been a while since I last made a video about the LOD planet, but today it's finally time again. In the last update, I talked about terrain elevation and normals. The plan was starting to get interesting, but still looked a bit bland. Well, this is the planet today. In this video, I'll get you through some interesting challenges that I faced while getting to this point, and I'll explain how I solved them. Hopefully, you'll find this video helpful, but even if you're not making an LOD planet yourself, this video might still be interesting. The project is on GitHub, and I've posted a link to the repo in the description. My name's Simon Holmquist, and this is LOD Planets. Episode 5 Comparing the current planet to the one you last saw, one difference is obvious. The color. There are quite a few ways of painting a planet, many of which I've tried. The first one I implemented was triplanar mapping. Imagine taking six projectors perpendicular to each other and pointing them towards the planet. The texture that the projectors project is really clear right at the center, but the textures merge where they intersect. This technique has many uses. For example, it's covered a texture in moons and plants with homogeneous low contrast surfaces, but doesn't quite work for more distinct surface features. This is the reason as to why I've put triplanar mapping on the shelf for now, but I'll probably bring it back later when I focus on more close-up stuff. I'll also briefly touch on my second attempt at texturing the planet. I tried making an LOD system for the texture based on the one I had already made for the geometry. It might have worked, but after trying for a long while, I realized that it was widely convoluted. The method I eventually settled on was this. Generate a texture for each of the planet's six faces that look good from far away. And then, as the player gets closer to the planet, transition to vertex colors. A core part of this method is mapping the textures onto the planet. The fact that I'm using a spherified cube with six distinct faces makes everything a lot less complicated. For other types of planets, this could be quite complex, since a single texture might need to be wrapped around the entire planet. It, it works, but at a cost. Now I'll explain how I actually generate the textures. Just remember, this is just some baseline tips, not a complete tutorial. You learn the theory by the code that I show is just intended to be an example. It's like pseudocode that actually works. <laughs> anyway, I created an array of the type color called Pix that will store all the pixels for one texture. After the array is initialized, I have a set of nested for loops, one for the Y coordinate and one for the X coordinate. I then initialize the two new variables, point X and point Y, in which I store a slightly modified version of the y and x coordinates. Instead of having the coordinates in the range of 0 to texture width, I want them to be from minus 1 to 1, since this is the format the texture UVs accept. That's simply done by first subtracting and then dividing by half of the texture width. Now that we know our x and y coordinates, we need to connect them to the actual real-world directions. Thankfully, we've already got the directions axis B and axis A from previous episodes and we can use them again, like so. By adding the scale directions together, we get a point on an imaginary plane. If we now add the faces positions relative to the planet to this vector and normalize the result, we arrive at a point on a unit sphere. We can now use this point, scaled as we wish, to sample from a 3D simplex noise. 
When we retrieve a value from noise, we want to store it at the correct index, the pixel array. To determine this index, we can multiply y by the texture width, and then just add x. When both loops are completed, we have a fully filled pixel array. The pixel array can now be pushed onto a texture using set pixels, which takes a color array and a mip map level as input. As we aren't concerned with mip mapping at the moment, we can just set that to zero. The last thing we need to do is to call the apply method on the texture and voila, set two. We now have this magnificent texture. Next, let's quickly go over how to sample from it. Instead of converting from scalar x and y values to vector components, we now need to convert vector components to scalars. The easiest way to do this is to use the dot product. In Unity, we can write vector3.dot and use the vertex position on the unit cube as the first parameter. For anyone who's confused, the unit cube position is the position of a vertex before we spherify the planet. If you are still confused, I suggest you watch my very first video in this series. Link in the description. The second parameter will be axis B for the X coordinate and axis A for the Y coordinate. This gives us the magnitude of the vertex position in the directions of axis A and B. We will use these values to create a vector 2. We then store this vector 2 in an array with all the UV coordinates. The index of a vertex in the vertex array corresponds to an index for a UV coordinate in the UV array. This is why I put my UV generation code right under my vertex generation code. Next, we assign the UV array to the faces mesh, like so. Before we can see the texture on the plants, we need a shader to which we can send it. The blueprint for the shader will be Unity's example of an unlit shader with no shadows. Available on their website. The reason as to why I insist on using an unlit shader even though I'm using shadows is that surface shaders don't provide as many options as an unlit shader. A surface shader might work for what I'm doing in this episode, but down the line it'll probably become obsolete. We don't need to add anything to the shader at the moment, so I'll go into the planet.cs script instead. Here we can loop through all the faces and apply their respective textures. This is done by accessing their mesh's render material, on which stacked texture is called. The first parameter is the name of the texture in the shader, which is just underscore main text. And the second parameter is the corresponding texture. Okay. Now we can display the texture on the planet without any weird stretching issues. But, uh oh, the borders are a bit weird. To be honest, I don't really know why this happens, but I managed to solve it by making the textures larger than they need to be while still sampling from the same area. This creates a sort of safety border around the textures. Instead of looking like this, the code now looks like this. If we go back to our planet, we can see that the ugly seams have disappeared. Great. One major problem still exists though. If you actually go into play mode and start flying away from the planet, this happens. Huh. The planet appears to be past the clipping plane of our camera. So let's just increase it right. Well, Turns out that the maximum clipping plane distance is 100,000 units, which is large, but not nearly enough. When I ran into this problem, I consulted the holy bible of LOD planets and space game design, the KSP dev talk at Unite 2013. According to the sacred words of Squad, Kerbal Space Program uses multiple cameras to compose the scene. One of these is responsible for rendering large objects far away. It accomplishes this using a very clever illusion. The far away camera records a minuscule copy 
of the universe, where the camera's position changes minimally compared to the movements of the main camera. From the distance they'll be used, this is indistinguishable from what the main camera would have seen had it been able to render the full-scale objects. This is all the code I used to move the faraway camera. Really nothing special at all. I've also created a duplicate of the planet's shader, called Far Shader, in which I've got this line of code. Here, I get each vertex in local space, and convert it to world space. Then it shrinks the world space position by some constant denominator, thus decreasing the planet's size, moving it closer to the origin. Lastly, it calculates where on the screen the vertex will be rendered. We want the main camera to render the planet using the normal planet shader, but we want the faraway camera to render using our new shader. To do this, I use set replacement shader. By calling it on the far camera, I can find all the shaders that use a specific tag, and replace them with our new shader. I've created a tag called planets, and added it like this to both the normal and the far away planet shader. We're almost done now, we just need to layer the cameras on top of each other. I did this by setting the main camera's clear flags to depth only, and then setting the far away camera's depth to something lower than the main camera's. For instance, since the main camera has a depth of minus 1, the far away camera has a depth of minus 2. I also make sure that the faraway camera only renders objects in the planet layer, so I select that in the color mask. Whew. Now we've basically created an additional miniature universe without any noticeable performance cost. Pretty neat. This looks good unless we get really close to the surface. Then the individual pixels become more noticeable, which isn't great. Instead, we'll use the vertex colors at this distance. Vertex colors are a built-in property of Unity's meshes, so we can assign those similarly to how we assign vertices. To test things out, I'll just make the vertex color pink. Before we can see it, however, we need to make some small modifications to our default planet shader. I want the pre-generated texture to smooth the fade into the vertex colors so I need some way of measuring the distance to the vertices. To do this, I create a float called dist in a v2f struct, and then set it equal to the distance from the camera to the vertex. Then, in the frag function, I divide dist by the clipping plane of the camera and clamp the result between 0 and 1. This generator value is 1 when we're right on the surface, and zero when we're at the distance of the clipping plane. Below that line, I get the vertex color from the mesh. I had to use gamma to linear space here because without it, vertex colors were quite pale. Finally, I set the color variable equal to the result of a lerp function between the vertex color and the texture color with a distance-based value created as the interpolator. If we go into play mode now, texture is visible when we're far away, but if we get closer to the surface, everything turns pink. Pink is cool and all, but we probably should generate something more appealing. And so the planet consists of a couple biome types. The biome at a specific point varies based on its y position, but the color may also vary based on height. The process of selecting the correct color goes as follows. First, all distinct types of biomes are defined as gradients. The point at which to sample the gradient is determined based on the elevation of the target point. You can then imagine that these layers are stacked on top of each other, like this each biome laying at a predefined depth. Note that a biome can begin, be interrupted by another biome, and then emerge again. The borders between the biomes are then smudged, so the transition from one to another isn't so abrupt. Finally, 
a slice of this to the gradient is extracted based on the y position of the target point. This is the gradient that we'll use to sample the final color. The actual order of operation isn't exactly like this, but it's functionally equivalent. To determine where one biome ends and another starts, I use another gradient. It's this gradient that dictates the order of the biomes in our imaginary stack. It uses different strengths of the color red to define the different regions. If the gradient has a red value of 0.6 at a point, that would correspond to the biome with an order value of 0.6. If the point had a value of 0.7, it would be a combination of the biome at 0.6 and the one after. The actual code is pretty straightforward once you understand the theory. So I'll just cover it briefly. Most of the magic is done in this method called get biome color. I call it when I generate the texture as well as when I generate the vertex color. It takes a biome config as a parameter, which is a scriptable object I have created to, you guessed it, store the biome configurations. I've got similar scriptable objects for the elevation configuration too. This is how the plant looks. It has two biomes, normal terrain and ice caps. These are the biome configurations. There's no need to make two different biomes for the ice caps, since they're practically identical. So the biome blend gradient starts with a value of zero, fades to one as it approaches the middle, and then fades back to zero. Fantastic! These are all the major additions I made to the planet, but I've also done some smaller things. For instance, I've improved the noise generation by working the code structure and adding new features such as turbulence. I made it possible to cache the planet so that it's visible outside of play mode. I've created my own double precision vector data type for precise vertex calculations. And I've implemented some basic multi-threading. Multi-threading is actually a really interesting topic, but I don't feel comfortable creating an educational video about it since I don't really know how I got it working. I'm also thinking about converting a large chunk of the code into compute shaders, so the current setup is very much subject to change. I've added the ability to simply turn off the multi-threading if it's causing you problems, but you'll probably have to endure some minor stuttering when the chunks are refreshed. The parent is now functional and could be used in your products, but there are still a few points of improvement. Chief among them is the lack of edge fans between the six phases. This seems like an easy problem, but it might cost $1,000 to emerge. It will definitely be in my next video though, so keep an eye out for that. Well, this marks the end of the video. I hope you found it interesting, and if you did, please consider subscribing and clicking the like button. This planet really has become quite beautiful. Anyway, I wish you all a great day. Bye. Thank you.